Welcome all of you to this live program in Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Christian Kunrads from Stralsund, Germany. Christian Kunrads is a professor and head of the Department of Orthopedics at the Hanseatic Hospital in Stralsund, Germany. After his medical school at the University of Ulm, he pursued orthopedic residency at the University of Bonn in Germany. He later undertook several fellowships, which included the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, the Nuffield Orthopedic Center in Oxford, the Center Hospitaler in Luxembourg, and the University of Tübingen in Germany. He has won several awards for his research, which includes the Ford Jacques Dura Award, and also for his excellent teaching at the University of Tübingen, where he worked before. He's certified instructor for the German Arthroscopy Society, the AGA, and has several high impact publications and book chapters to his credit. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Professor Christian Kondrauts from Stralsund, Germany. Over to you, Christian. Thank you for your kind introduction and thank you for your invitation to Orthopedic Principles. It's a pleasure to being part of this program. Today, we talk about distal biceps tendon tears. And I will go through anatomy and biomechanics. I will talk shortly about etiology and epidemiology. And then we go deeper into diagnostics and therapy, which is mostly surgical in this injury. And I say a few words about the used implants. As in every standard procedure, I try to make it as precise as possible and at the same time, as simple as possible. So regarding the anatomy, we have to know that the distal biceps tendon in its course from proximal to distal, it um, makes a external torsion of about 90 degrees before it inserts at the radial tuberosity. The distal biceps tendon consists functionally in, um, of two bundles representing the long head and the short head of the proximal biceps. And the long head bundle inserts more proximal posterior at the tuberosity and the, so to speak, short head bundle inserts more distally anterior at the tuberosity. When we do a reattachment of the tendon stump, we, make, we need to make sure that we do the insertion point here in the anatomical region, because otherwise when we uh, reattach it more anterior, which is obviously easier to reach, but then we can't restore the supination force completely. And this is the main goal of the surgery to recreate the supination force. When the, in cases the distal biceps tendon is torn, then the flexion force is reduced less than 50%, but the supination force is reduced more than 50%, which is exceptionally important in handymen and workers which use the supination force or sportsmen who need this, especially the supination force. The distal biceps tendon tear is a yeah, quite rare um, injury. It happens through a certain mechanism when we have eccentric strain uh, in flexion and supination which happens, for example, when you uh, have a heavy weight slipping and you try to re-grab it. Rather rare injury, I said, but um, still on a regular basis, we see these patients with those injuries. Mainly they are males in the fifth or fifth decade of their life, as we uh, already know it from other tendon ruptures like the quadriceps tendon or so on. There are certain risk factors for tears of the distal biceps. It's bodybuilding, especially when patients use anabolic steroids, but it's also smoking and radio ulnar impingement. 
Now we go to the clinical examination. There's one specific test we need to know. It's the so-called hook test described by O'Driscoll. So you abduct the sh shoulder of the patient 90 degrees, elbow flex 90 degrees, and uh, supination with the thumb uh, to the ceiling. And then in an intact distal biceps, you can put a hook or a finger behind the distal biceps tendon. If the distal biceps tendon is torn, then you can palpate the brachialis tendon. But behind the brachialis tendon, you can't really hook in. That's only possible in an intact distal biceps tendon. Of course, in the acute setting, the patient has pain. Reduced muscle contour can be seen. In most cases, ecchymosis and a reduced supination force. Here we see a clinical image with a inverse Popeye sign, torn distal biceps tendon in a chronic case. When it comes to imaging, we wanna know that there's no bony injury, rarely the case. So we do a two-plane X-ray of the elbow in a standard setting. We can use sonography. Um, of course, this is examiner dependent. And in a clear acute setting, we don't need the MRI. It's nice to have. And I would say in chronic cases, uh, it's standard to do an MRI of the elbow. But in acute cases, you don't need that if there's a uh, Injury is clear, which is uh, the case in most patients. So in um, a normal MRI, the tendon and tendon stump, they are normally not in one um, slide to be seen. So there's a special position for the MRI, which you can use if you talk to the radiologist. That's the FAPS position, the flexion, abduction, supination position. And this is pictured here. And then you have the best chance to see the tendon in one slide, the whole tendon, which is intact here or torn in the other image. So now we come to the indications for surgery. So in all patients, you want to have the normal or almost normal supination force. Um, in acute settings with complete tears, we go for surgery. In partial tears, if the pain doesn't resolve or there is still a function deficit, then we also go for surgery. In chronic tears, we um, have to think and talk to the patient a lot because in real chronic tears, sometimes you would need a tendon graft. And in those cases, the clinical results are much worse than uh, in acute settings due to scarring, the tissue can't glide uh, to, between each other. And um, I would see the option for going for conservative treatment in those cases where you need the, uh, such a graft. So, when we look into the literature, we see for partial distal biceps tears that patients who have um, a distal biceps tendon tear of more than 50% of the footprint, then um, conservative treatment is not so good in the end. So, most of these patients still then after conservative treatment, go to surgery. But in partial tears, the surgery at a later time leads to the same good results as early surgery. Yeah. If you go firstly for conservative treatment, then you uh, go for a free range of motion. You also um, do no weight bearing for, the, for eight weeks. Now we go to the surgery. Um, in the old days, we did a big approach through the crease of the elbow, 
here on the right side, there's the shoulder. On the um, left-hand side, there is uh, the hand. Nowadays, we do a small single incision approach going to the fascia, uh, taking care of the nervus cutaneus antebrachii lateralis. And we go deep on the medial border of the brachioradialis muscle, hold the brachialis muscle to the radial side and go to the bone, ligating or coagulating some crossing vessels. In all cases, uh, if the lacertus fibrosus is torn, this is not always the case, but if it is torn, then the tendon stump is always on the proximal side of the elbow crease. And then we don't do a big approach, but we do a step incision or two centimeter incision proximal to the elbow crease over the distal biceps muscle, slightly medial to the middle of the arm. Then we open up the fascia and we can retract the tendon. We use a holding by cruel suture and then we can shuttle it into our um, main approach over the tuberosity and can go from there. I use two anchors and I use all suture anchors nowadays, which were to be shown that they are as stable as all other uh, anchors. Um, clinical studies couldn't show that two anchors are better than one anchor, but I find it more secure and I can recreate the tendon attachment on the tuberosity more anatomically um, and a wider footprint recreation using two anchors. That's why, that's why I use two all suture anchors today. It's good when you use the anchor system where you only need to drill one cortex. I think this leads to less um, heterotopic ossifications. And then how you do the suture technique, you could use a MyTech reduction stitch, which is shown here, or you can uh, use some type of Quaco sutures or baseball sutures. In principle, it's important that you uh, stitch one end of the suture anchor um, several times through the tendon and the other end only one time, so you can pull at the second um, end of the suture to bring the tendon to the bone. That's important. For the post-operative protocol, we use a elbow orthosis where we can uh, position the arm in slight supination and at first 80, degree, 80 degrees of flexion. And from this position, we um, allow for extension of 20 degrees. So it's 60 degrees of flexion and then 20 degrees more in the direction of uh, extension every two weeks. But this protocol needs to be adapted to the intraoperative tension. So you don't, um, so you don't um, do too less range of motion not less than it's, it's needed. And you can start muscle strengthening um, slightly after three months, gradually increasing. Maximal weights shouldn't be done um, before six months. Concluding, I want to stress that complete tears should be treated um, by early surgery. I schedule my patients um, within one week, if possible. Uh, we strive for anatomical recreation of the footprint, which means we put the anchors in the tuberosity far enough medial and posterior. Therefore, you need to supinate the forearm maximally. This also prevents 
during the approach prevents injuries to the posterior interosseous nerve is important. Um, we aim for restoration of supination force, especially in handymen and uh, workers. And early rehab protocol can, of course, be adjusted to the intraoperative tension. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, Christian, you can stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Christian, for this uh, comprehensive presentation on uh, distal biceps. Let's have a short uh, Q and A session. Uh, Christian, what do you think is the advantage of using suture anchors compared to a bone tunnel or even suspensory fix fixation? Yeah. Um... Several techniques exist. Um, almost all of them have the same um, um, cut out forces, so to speak. But uh, this is very anatomical. And um, if you put a bone tunnel and the tendon in the bone, you always shorten a little bit the tendon functionally. And um, Probably the patient needs longer to do full extension or there's more tension force on the reconstruction. So I try to go for as anatomical um, um, result as possible. Thank you, Christian, for that. And Christian, what do you think is the incidence of heterotropic ossification with this approach? Um, it's less than 5% for sure. Um, we did some research in different trauma cases and so on. And with the elbow, it's a little, little bit different and um, not so clear as with the hip. So we found out that not non-steroidal um, antiphlogistica, they don't help at the elbow. So we left it out. Okay, Christian, whenever we talk about a two incision, for example, in your case, you have two incisions, right? One is anterior and one is in the posterolateral, right? So that is a classic uh, two incision technique, isn't it? Now, in, in my technique, I have one incision and the second incision is not what it's uh, understood as a two incision technique, but it's also, it's only a proximal helping incision to um, stay very small with the main approach. In a classical two incision approach, you do it posteriorly. And then the, perios, um, the posterior interosseous nerve is more at risk. And I think this is not needed. So you can just address everything anteriorly, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christian. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this crisp presentation. And I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people all over the world. Thank you, Hattach. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Christian, we are offline. Uh, please send me your cell phone number. Okay, yeah.